whether we're talking about economic shocks, social unrest, culture wars, natural disasters, I think you'll all agree that these are really important times in the study of human resilience. Now, it's not that we haven't faced challenges before. Of course we have. It's just that the scale and the complexity of the challenges are growing. And if we're going to find solutions to these, we're going to have to realize that we're going to have to bring together knowledge from different fields. And we're also going to have to realize that a society's resilience doesn't just depend on its physical infrastructure, but on its social infrastructure, too. And as a psychologist, the question I want to talk about today is how do we build that? How do we foster social resilience? To find the answer, we first have to realize something that we already know, and that is that disruption is not something new. Right? We humans have faced it for millennia. And if we didn't have a capacity for resilience, we wouldn't be here right now. We would have died out a long time ago. But just because we're here, it doesn't mean that there haven't been failures along the way, where some individuals and societies were resilient, others were not. And what we really need to know right, is why that's so. We need to know what works and what doesn't, and how can we foster the stuff that does. Well, one thing we do know about how humans respond to disruption is that we do it in one of two ways. We either stand together or we stand alone. We either come together, support each other, and cooperate, or we hoard our own resources and say to hell with everybody else. Which one of these is better? Well, all the simulations and models out there, some of the best done by people like Martin Nowak and colleagues at Harvard, suggest that cooperation, compassion, and trust are the strategies that lead to the best outcomes in the long run. Sure, in the moment, you can um, hoard your resources. You can ignore other people. You can price gouge them in the face of a disaster. And you'll profit right then and there. But in the long run, it's a very poor strategy. Your social bonds and support and those of your society will shred and fall apart. And so that answer is part of the question about social resilience. We, need to, we know that working together is better than working alone. But what it doesn't tell us anything about is how to increase that, how to foster that strategy. How do we do that? Well, I'm a fan of looking back at the past to see what's worked then to see if we can improve it now. And I'm also a big fan and, and, and firm believer that the Dalai Lama is onto something when he says that love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. And there's a firm belief among many spiritual leaders, like the Dalai Lama, but many other traditions as well, that meditation can actually foster compassion. But is that so? Is that, is that right? If you if you read the paper nowadays, you will find that meditation does lots of things. It's kind of become trendy, right? It will increase your memory. It will increase your creativity. It will increase your workers' productivity. It's good for your blood pressure. Hell, it even increases your standardized test scores. Now, that's all well and fine. I have no problem with that. But that's not what it was designed for. It's not what it was developed for. Buddha and other ancient meditation teachers didn't really care about SATs and GMAT. Right? If you look at what they cared about, Buddha in his own words said, I, I teach one thing and one thing only, and that is suffering and the end of suffering. And so what my students and I wanted to find out is, does meditation actually work this way? Will it actually help to decrease suffering, to increase cooperation among people? And so we designed a very simple study. We um, brought people, we recruited people from the greater Boston area. And we brought them uh, into the lab. We told them this is an eight-week study on meditation. And there were 39 people that took part. And they had to be willing to take part in eight weeks of meditation and to uh, not have been meditators before. And then what we did was we randomly assigned half of them to be in the wait list and half of them to actually take the course. The reason for this was we needed people who were equally interested in meditation so we weren't getting a self-selection bias. Those who actually participated in meditation classes came once a week to meditation classes here on campus that were led by a, an ordained Buddhist lama. They also had um, MP3s that they would listen to during the week for guided meditation that were produced by the, by the lama. And then at the end of eight weeks, we brought those who were on the wait list and those who were actually meditated back to the lab. And they thought they were coming for some cognitive test that we were going to you know, measure their 
their attention and their memories, which we, we, we did. But what we were really interested in is what happened before any of that started. They came to the lab, and in the lab, um, there were three chairs outside of the lab, excuse me. And um, two of them were filled by actors who worked for us, but who the subjects believed were probably just other subjects. So when the subject arrived, what did they do? Uh, he or she, well, all but one. One guy wouldn't sit down. But the rest of them all sat down in the, in the third chair. And then another actor appeared. And this actor had on, um, she was on crutches. She had one of those boots on when you have a broken foot. And she would come walking down the hall looking very much in pain and wincing and walk to the end and kind of just lean up against the chair. Now our two other subjects were instructed, I mean our two other actors were instructed to ignore this person so they would look at their iPhone, they would look at her look away, just completely ignoring, kind of like you see on the T sometimes. But the question for us was what would the real subject do? Would that person actually get up and try and relieve this other person's suffering to help them out or not? Well, what we found actually startled me at, at the, the size of the effect, right? So three out of 19 people in the control condition, that was people who were interested in meditation but hadn't meditated. Only three of them got up to help this person, okay? Out of the meditators, it was 50%, right? 10 out of 20 immediately got up and came to this person's aid. Now, that's a three-fold increase. Right? Imagine what we could do in society if we could increase people's willingness to help by threefold. And so what I think this shows is at least that meditation really will make a society, make a populace much more likely to come to each other's aid. But there's a problem, right? We're busy. Not, I, I, not many of you, I would guess, would give up time to come for eight weeks of meditation or practice it regularly, even if you wanted to. Sometimes you just don't have the time in your schedule to do it. The other problem is, in the face of a looming natural disaster where we need to kickstart cooperation and compassion, it's not always very easy to pull out a cushion and sit on it, right? Like a hurricane is bearing down on you or some other tragedy. And so what we really need is a way to nudge compassion, right? To, to rapidly increase how much it will occur within a society to help them address challenges especially among groups that may not always get along that well. And just to convince you that this is possible, let me tell you uh, a quick story, one of my favorite stories that illustrates this point. In 1914, outside of Ypres, Belgium, the British and the Germans were facing off in World War I. It was a long and bloody battle. And as the Brits sat there in their trenches looking across the no man's land to where the Germans were, they started to see lights appearing. Then they started to hear songs. They didn't know what the songs were because they were singing in German. But they soon recognized by the melodies that what they were were Christmas carols. And then what happened next was incredibly surprising, even to the men who were there. Both sides came out of their trenches. They started talking. They started exchanging trinkets. They started showing pictures of their families and celebrating together. Now, these were men who the day before were trying to kill each other. Yet here they were celebrating and supporting each other. And the reason why I think that happened is because in those few minutes, they weren't thinking about themselves as British and German, but rather as fellow Christians. Now, this raises an interesting question. How do you go from one minute trying to kill someone to the next minute celebrating with them. Right? How do we display such compassion in one moment and such cruelty the next? To answer that, you have to think about a different question, and that is the world is full of more people than we can possibly help. How do we decide who is worthy of our help? We all have this experience. We'll walk past homeless people who won't do anything. We see other people that, you know, you see the commercials on TV where individuals or, or charities are needing help and we ignore them, not because we're bad people, but because it's, it's almost impossible to help everyone. And so your mind has a mechanism for trying to determine whose pain is it worthwhile for you to feel. And the way that we think it does that is by a simple metric, and that metric is similarity. Right? Now, this wouldn't be very surprising to you if I told you on the battlefield, 
an American soldier is walking and he sees a wounded American soldier and a wounded member of the Taliban and they have the same exact injuries and he feels more compassion for the American. That wouldn't surprise anyone, right? They're on the same team after all. But what we think is that this bias is so deeply embedded in the mind that any marker of similarity, not long-standing conflicts alone or long-standing um, coalitions alone will make it work. It suggests that it's not the severity of a disaster that determines how much compassion we feel and how much we want to help someone. It determines it's dependent upon whether or not we see that we see ourselves in the person who is suffering. And so we wanted to strip similarity down to its most basic metric to prove that this was actually what was going on. And so to do, to do that, we used something called motor synchrony, which is just moving in time with someone. We see this a lot. We see this in drills in the army, you see it in conga lines, you see it lots of places. The idea is simple, right? If two individuals or more are moving together, if they're mirroring each other, it's a marker that right here, right now, for this moment at least, their goals, their needs are joined. And so we wanted to see if we could use this property to actually nudge compassion. And so, again, we designed, we, we designed another experiment. This time we brought people into the lab and we told them, this is a music perception study. And so they sat down and they put on earphones. And picture this, you're sitting at a table across from somebody else, and this other person works for us as an actor, but you think he or she is just another subject. You hear tones, and your only job is to tap the sensor on the table in front of you as you hear tones. Now, the trick was, some of these people, the tones were designed so that, that they would tap their hands in unison because they were hearing different wearing different earphones. And for others, they would tap their hands in a completely random way so that there was no linkage among them. After this happened, you then saw the person who you were tapping with. Now remember, you didn't talk to this person. You didn't say anything to this person. You just sat across the table from them. You saw this person get cheated by somebody else. And to make a long story short, and what that basically means is that person got stuck doing this god-awful, long, onerous task that none of our subjects would like doing. And then, we simply asked our subjects um, as they were leaving. We said, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. If you want to do any of the work, you can, and it will kind of relieve the burden of the other people. And so they had to decide, do they want to do this or not? Well, the interesting thing was, we also asked them a few other questions, which was, how similar do you think you were to this other person? Now remember, in both cases, they didn't know this person. But if they tapped their hands in time, they thought they were more similar. They told us they were more similar. And they'd create the story why. They'd say, oh, I, he reminds me of somebody that I know, or I think we we're in the same classes. None of this was true. Right? This was just an actor that we hired. But because their mind interpreted that motor synchrony as a marker that their goals were joined, it gave them an intuition that this person was like me, that we're on the same team. We then asked them, how much compassion did you feel? And they were again reported this on a, on a seven point scale. They felt more compassion for the person who they had been tapping their hands in time with. And remember, the objectives of the situation are the same. Both people got cheated in the same way. Both people are suffering, doing this task in the same way. But how much compassion you felt for the person was dependent upon whether or not you felt that you were similar to this person. How did it affect whether or not they actually decided to help? Well, in the bottom row here, you can see um, six out of 34 people decided to help the person when they were tapping out of sync. Right? But almost 50%, 17 out of 35, decided that they would help this person if they were tapping their hands together. Now, they had no conscious understanding of why they felt this way. But they felt more compassion if they had tapped their hands in time with this person. They felt more similar. And they said, yes, I'm going to get up. and I'm going to go and spend my time helping this person with the task they have to do. Now, what this suggests is that social resilience, cooperation, compassion, all of these things aren't a trait that resides within you. They're very flexible, and they're very um, determined by, by the situation itself to a great degree. Now, many of us here in Boston 
right, last year faced a different challenge, a, a, a terrible tragedy, right? Many of you will remember the Boston Marathon bombing. To my mind, one of the factors that, that gave rise to many of the heroic acts of compassion we saw that day was that people felt linked. Right? On that day, people weren't thinking about themselves as an Italian or as a Kenyan or as a student or as a stockbroker. They were thinking of themselves and they saw themselves as part of a family, a larger family, the marathon family, right? people who were here to celebrate, to enjoy this thing together. That's really all it takes to foster compassion, is to change how we think about each other and to feel linked to each other. And really, in some ways, that's what meditation does. right? Part of the goal of meditation is to um, evoke this state called equanimity. What equanimity means is I'm seeing friends as enemies and enemies as friends. As friends. It breaks down the artificial barriers we put around each other based on race or based on religion or based on political ideology. It makes us see each other as linked. And if we can do that, if we see each other as similar, as joined, we will come to each other's aid more. So what does that mean in Boston? It means don't think about your neighbor, your new neighbor, as the guy who likes the Yankees. It means think about him as the guy who likes Starbucks just as much as you do. Right? There's nothing magic about tapping your hands any marker of similarity will do. We've done it with having people wear the same color wristbands and, and lots of other ways. When you do that, right, strange things can happen. Many of you will remember after the bombings, um, simply by taking the perspective of themselves as fans of baseball and not as fans of the opposing team. Right? We heard Yankees fans sing Sweet Caroline, the Red Sox theme song at Yankee Stadium. Not a very frequent occurrence. But it's not just silly things like singing. Right? It's things that in some ways really matter. When Superstorm Sandy hit uh, New York um, last year, or two years ago in 2012, it devastated lots of areas of, of Brooklyn. Um, and the AP in the summer of 2013 did a great study. They wanted to look at what factors determined a neighborhood's resilience controlling for how much they were damaged, of course, in the first place. The number one predictor was how much the people in that neighborhood believed that they could trust and rely on their other neighbors to have compassion for them and to cooperate with them. That was the number one predictor of which neighborhoods were most resilient, which got up and running, which got commerce going, et cetera. And so I really believe that social resilience matters just as much as physical infrastructure because that's what gets people and the social enterprise working again. So how do we kickstart this, right? How do we increase this? Well, you know, now with the advent of social media, we have tools that we never had before. We can understand people's connections and scan their profiles in milliseconds. Right? And so if when people are communicating, whether they're communicating because they're having um, uh, problems online in terms of things like bullying or other types of hostility, or whether we need to increase cooperation on people who don't know each other. One thing we can simply do is when they communicate is search their profiles. Find what they have in common and surface this material to them in the background even. Right? It's no different than tapping your hands. Any marker your mind will pick up on and it will change how you feel about that other person and how much you're willing to cooperate with them and how much they're willing to cooperate with you. And one of the best parts about these effects is that if you can nudge them to a tipping point, they will spread virally. Right? They will cause upward cascades of increasing cooperation, compassion, and resilience. They will increase people's willingness to pay it forward. And so anything that we can do by leveraging technology to kind of push those buttons in our mind, push those buttons that meditation and mindfulness might do after lots of work, but many, many people aren't going to do or don't have the time to do, then I think we can have a great impact. Right? We can have a great impact on rapidly increasing empathy, cooperation, compassion, and resilience to people and areas of the world that need it, either chronically or need it immediately in the face of a disaster. How we do that is, I think, a question worth examining, and it's something that I hope 
all of you will, will think about in your respective fields. Thanks.